Thank you, Don. And thanks everyone for being here today for a very important and timely conversation. Um, I'm really honored and, and grateful to be joined today by David Cobb, a visionary leader and activist. And unfortunately, um, as you heard, Kali Akuno is not going to be joining us today, but um, we are going to share some of his resources and David will do a great job because he truly is an expert on this topic. Um, first, before I introduce David, I want to briefly share some framing for this conversation. Many of us are struggling, to say the least, um, to reckon with and work to address the converging ecological, economic, social, cultural, political crises um, we're experiencing as humanity on this planet and which are feeling particularly salient here in the U.S. with our upcoming election. Um, and though many in the transition movement, kind of our, I would say our root culture of transition um, tends to avoid or eschew um, politics in our work, party politics, in order to avoid what a lot of people feel is like toxic polarization um, and wanting to maintain our positive solutions focus. There's also increasing recognition we're hearing um, from from our network of the need to rec reclaim our democracy and be able to govern ourselves if we truly want to create um, systemic change. And I'm going to screen share here for a moment to show you this um, wonderful, inspiring quote from uh, a resource called From Banks and Tanks to Cooperation and Caring, a strategic framework for a just transition that was developed by Movement Generation and um, was assigned course reading for the last session of our Social Justice Community of Practice, which is a really wonderful um, resource program that we're running right now. But this quote mm. is obviously, if we are not prepared to govern, we are not prepared to win. Um, so with that said, we at Transition US have been intentionally making space for grassroots leaders across the country to grapple with the question of what a transition response looks like to the unprecedented moment in which we're living. Um, how can we respond to the gravity of the situation we're dealing with while maintaining the kind of positive solutions oriented approach that has drawn so many of us to the transition movement. Sorry, I have this fly that's just up in my business here. Um, <laughs> um, and so the Transition US Policy and Politics National Working Group, which is made up of local transition leaders from across the country, um, designed today's session. As part of its monthly webinar series, to provide an opportunity for us to particularly examine short and long-term strategies to uphold election integrity and reclaim our democracy. And as I said, we're very fortunate to have with us today, um, David Cobb. Thank you so much, Marissa oh, and Don. David, and, I'm gonna read oh, your bio first. Oh. That's okay, I just wanted to pull up this lovely slide with um, this this great in this great image from Cooperation Humboldt, um, so you can get a little bit more of a sense of David's local work, as well as Kali's local work with Cooperation Jackson, which is on the left there. Um, yes, I have to tell everyone, David, about all of your accolades. <laughs> <laughs> I know you love that. Um, so David's a co-founder of Cooperation Humboldt and the and the Politics and Policy National Working Group of Transition U.S. And he's also a member of our um, Transition U.S. Collaborative Design Council. He's a people's lawyer who has sued corporate polluters, lobbied elected officials, run for political office himself, and been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. He believes we must provoke and win a peaceful revolution for a peaceful, just, and sustainable society if, we're, if we are to survive. David was born in rural Texas and worked as a laborer before going to college and law school. He maintained a, maintained a successful law practice in Houston for almost a decade before devoting himself to full-time social change efforts. In 2002, to David ran for Attorney General of Texas, pledging to use the office to revoke the charters of corporations that repeatedly violate health, safety, and environmental laws. And particularly relevant to today's talk, in 2004, David ran for President of the United States, 
on the Green Party ticket and forced a recount in Ohio that helped launch the election integrity movement. In 2010, he co-founded Move to Amend, a campaign for a constitutional amendment to abolish the illegitimate court-created doctrines of corporate constitutional rights and money equals speech. In 2016, he served as the campaign manager for Jill Stein's presidential campaign. So in a moment, I'm going to invite David to share some opening remarks and context, context and we'll have a, a moderated conversation. I have some follow-up questions for David, and then we'll have some audience Q&A. Um, but I just want to remind us all, um, as David probably would as well, that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And um, we, as that, we can't support or um, oppose any particular um, candidates. And that's not what we're here to do today. We are here to provide education on how to reclaim and maintain our democracy. And now with that, over to you, David. Thank you so much, Marissa, and to Don, uh, and to all of you for being here, not only as part of the transition movement, but uh, this conversation. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging uh, that the way I look at social change, there is, we, are, we need to both resist harms and abuses and build alternatives. And with no, without doubt, Transition US is one of the premier organizations uh, helping to build alternatives. And that's the, that's the sweet spot. Uh, that's, that's what Transition offers and frankly does and does very well. But in this particular historic moment, I think we are called also to resist what I believe to be growing fascism in this country. And in order to do that, I am very, going to just sort of talk about this historic moment. And when I say this historic moment, I'm, I mean, like, not just this election cycle, not just this, this, this moment, I mean, globally, because I believe, and I, many of my colleagues believe that we are in a conjuncture. Now, a conjuncture is a way to understand history itself, because if you want to know what's going to happen uh, today, 99 times out of 100, just study what happened yesterday. And if you want to predict what is likely to happen tomorrow, 99 times out of 100, study today. Because the way history moves in terms of arcs and the, uh, the broad sweep of history uh, are, are patterns and they're systems and you can really understand them. However, there do come times in history where there are conjunctures, where there are inherently contradictory forces that are at play that end up meaning that there is a drastic split and change. And it is that which makes this a historic moment. And I think that it's worth pointing out that the last time fascism emerged globally was in the 1930s, because there was a global conjuncture there. And in essence, society was literally globally moving from an agrarian one to an industrial one. And fascism became one of the possible ways to restructure society. Because fascism is not merely jackbooted thugs and totalitarianism. Fascism is a social, political, and economic ideology, and it requires a mass movement of people actually supporting it. So that conjuncture of the 1930s uh, and the global things that were at play is the reason that a version of fascism emerged in different places. Today, we are in another global conjuncture. Uh, and that global conjuncture, at least on the economic front, is happening because we are literally watching our society restructure itself. We are moving out of the industrial society for economic production of goods and services and distributing them to, uh, some folks call it the information age, uh, the digital age, but the point is it is literally restructuring society. And for so many people, there is a deep fear about that. And many people, especially in this country and frankly, poor white folks do not see what their place is and that they are desperately scared and afraid. And fascism, uh, whether you name it or not, is a way to organize society to, to, to assure a return to some greater ideal. So that's the big picture uh, of uh, fascism as I understand it, uh, and the reason that we're seeing it emerge now. Um, and again, the 
the number of, of parallels are quite eerie. If you're interested, please go to, um, uh, or just do an internet search. Uh, don't Google it, that's a noun, not a verb. But do do an internet search on the 14 characteristics of capital of fascism and read it and ask yourself how many of these things are happening and have been emerging. I do wanna underscore, it is not dependent on one individual and we need to get that idea out of our head because what we are experiencing is a social movement, a, uh, a, a, a growing number of folks are getting more and more comfortable with hypernationalism, militarism, violence, uh, and it is really something that, that uh, is for us shocking, but I also wanna put it into historic per perspective and remind folks that in the 1930s before uh, the World War uh, actually erupted and the U.S. Uh, got brought into it. During that moment, there was an explicit American fascist movement. It was called the Bund, B-U-N-D, uh, and literally they sold out Madison Square Garden multiple times. Uh, it was, it, there were chapters all across this country. Um, uh, so this is not new. It's just something that we're not particularly aware of. Now, that's the big picture. And again, as Marissa says, we are not here to electioneer for or against any candidate, but instead to understand what is actually happening. And I do think that there are three possible election scenarios that we should name out loud. Uh, and you know, two of them we're all already accustomed to. And as social change agents, we, uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I have been part of movement moments and strategy sessions where we say, okay, presidential election is coming up. The first hundred days are, are really important. So what are the first hundred days? And what you typically do is say, okay, if the Democratic candidate wins, then this is what the terrain looks like that we're going to navigate to our vision for a peaceful, just democratic world. So scenario one, the Democrat wins, what do we do? And the second scenario that we're used to, and I bet you've already deduced it, Republican wins the presidency. So what do we do? How do we navigate? Those are the two scenarios uh, that we're used to. I'm, I submit to you that we have to come to terms with a third scenario that none of us have entertained. I don't think any of us are really ready for. And that is a scenario where a candidate loses the election and refuses to leave and tries to call forth uh, the social movement to both protect him and to keep him in office. That scenario, uh, there's no other way to call it but a fascist coup d'etat, and I think that that's actually the conversation that I'm looking forward to have, having. There's lots more that I could say, but I, I did want to just provide that big, broad context uh, for how I see this historic moment and the three potential election scenarios. And at this point, I'm wondering, Marissa, did you want me to talk about uh, responses and resources or should we just get into the conversation? Either way, we could do responses and resources now or um, towards the end. I think that we should just get into the conversation uh, so that we can uh, really and start to solicit uh, feedback from uh, other transitioners who are here. And let's, because I will tell you, I really hope I'm wrong but I don't think I am. So I'm gonna solicit folks to, to talk me down from this ledge, if you can, right? Like use the chat function, use, the, use this, this space to say, David, here's the reasons why you are being over dramatic or what am I missing? Because yeah. I've looked at this and I don't think I am. So I think there's, there's two good ways to join the conversation. Uh, one is to, uh, type your question into the Q&A module on your screen and submit it that way if you just prefer us read your question. Uh, or you can uh, just type the letter H in the chat and we can actually uh, promote you to panelists so that you can ask your question uh, live with video and audio. And we've got a ready for resources and strategies. Um, 
Well, David, to start, maybe we could talk about what kinds of strategies we should be looking at in the short term, um, as well as the longer term. Those were both things we were going to talk about today with Kali. Yes. Uh, so I can tell you there are a number of uh, places that I would uh, refer folks to, uh, and I'll just name them out loud. Uh, one is, and I think that you've got a slide for this, Marissa. So I'll, I'll uh, so one is, uh, Choose Democracy. Uh, this is a group that uh, is uh, being led by the leaders at Training for Change, which are a phenomenal group of uh, nonviolent direct action uh, practitioners. Uh, George Lakey is the person I know there. Uh, and I can tell you that Training for Change was at the forefront of training nonviolent civil disobedience activists during the global justice movement uh, of the 90s. Uh, but they were also very involved in. Uh, uh, anti-nuclear work. Uh, the point is that that one thing that I think that we have to really put into our toolbox is nonviolent civil disobedience. And the group Choose Democracy, which you can find at choosedemocracy.us, is already beginning to host um, a series of trainings on how to engage that tactic. But I do want to really be be clear that Choose Democracy and nonviolent civil disobedience is a tactic. How you use it is part of the strategy, the overall strategy. And for me, uh, here we go, choose democracy. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and I think that the thing to really understand is that this is a growing group of folks that say we'll, that they will refuse to accept election results until all votes are counted and will nonviolently take to the streets if the coup is attempted. And this also comes out of the strategic framework of Gene Sharp and other nonviolent uh, or studiers of nonviolence. And I, I, you'll, you'll see how many times I'm saying the word nonviolence because I am a nonviolent practitioner. Yes, I'm a revolutionary. I am committed to restructuring society. I do not believe in the affirmative use of violence as a way of, of gaining uh, uh, that, that restructuring. Now, I don't want to get into it, but I'm not a pacifist. I do believe in the defense of myself and the defense of others, but it is only in a defensive posture, never, ever as an affirmative, positive uh, first step. And so that first uh, uh, place, this idea of being willing and able to do nonviolent civil disobedience is to prepare ourselves that if necessary, we will shut this country down to protect the integrity of the democratic process. And I do think it's important to note that this has been done successfully in this country many times. In fact, uh, some of you may uh, remember, or maybe even were part of something that we called the Pledge of Resistance uh, back in uh, the mid 80s, uh, when many of us uh, signed a pledge of particular actions we would take to shut the country down if US uh, foreign, uh, or pardon me, U.S. combat troops were sent uh, anywhere into Central America or South America. And many people, myself included, believe that part of the reason that Ronald Reagan did, never was willing to escalate uh, throughout Central and South America with U.S. combat troops was the fact that there were literally, before the internet, hundreds of thousands, and I mean literally hundreds of thousands of people using phone trees and telephone calls uh, and uh, mimeograph sheets uh, had already said, we'll shut this country down. Uh, and so I'm going to stop for a moment and uh, invite either Marissa or Don, uh, any comments or questions about Choose Democracy or anyone else. Yeah, I would love to chime in on this. Um, I love this infographic here, How to Stop a Coup. And I've been studying the Choose Democracy resources to prepare for today. And a couple of things I wanted to draw attention to um, that seem especially important. One is we need to be prepared for delayed election results, knowing that it, we may not, we likely won't have a clear, um, you know, uh, new president on or a clear victor on November 2nd, as we're used to. Um, it, it's a process that, that could take months up to inauguration date. And we just have to have that in our minds that this is probably gonna be different than it has been in the past, or it, it possibly could be different than it has been in the past. Um, 
Another important one of these, know that a coup can happen in the US. Um, for me, that's always something I think about as happening elsewhere, um, not in our, our country, but um, we need to be aware of that possibility, especially with uh, rhetoric that we've heard and um, to call it a coup if, if that's what is happening. Um, and then know that coups have been stopped by regular people. Um, I believe I read, I think over half, half of coups around the world have been unsuccessful largely because of the, the presence of, of people resisting and taking to the streets. Um, and on that note, I really appreciate this, this piece here about commit to actions that represent stability and nonviolence. Um, what Choose Democracy explains is that our goal has to be to reach the folks who are undecided about the way that they want to see things go. And um, that's why creating a sense of stability is very important so that um, this path uh, away from the coup is going to create more stability than going along with the coup. And then um, the other kind, the other points are basically now's the time to prepare. We have a, you know a few weeks to leading up to election um, date, and there are a lot of other great resources we're going to be sharing with you. I know Choose Democracy has been organizing uh, trainings. I've heard there have been thousands of people participating in those, which is heartening. And uh, thank you so much. So uh, I also note that Skip actually uh, took me up on my challenge. Uh, and for those of you who are watching and not reading the, the chat, I, I'll read his response. Skip says, I'll try to play devil's advocate, although I fear your scenario is all too plausible. The argument would be that Congress would step in to assert and validate the election. Perhaps we should be getting Republican senators to pre-declare that they are committed to a peaceful transition, question mark. Uh, Skip also says the FBI seems to remain relatively independent and hopeful the Joint Chief and I'm hopeful the Joint Chiefs would also remain independent to enforce the proper electoral outcome. To which I say, I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh, and uh, my quick read, I was frankly talking to Don and Marissa just before uh, this and uh, I actually am, have been very heartened uh, that many of the actions that I saw the Trump administration take in the last uh, several months, I perceived to be trial balloons to test how the military would act, uh, how the Republican establishment would act, how the Democratic Party establishment would act, how, how uh, the entire sort of social system would act. Now, for those of you who know me, uh, you already know this, and if you were listening as Marissa uh, uh, read my bio, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm no fan of the neoliberal Democratic Party. Uh, but I do think it's, it's, it's fair to see and, and, and easy to understand that the, uh, the, the, that march across DuPont Circle, uh, uh, literally uh, as the Floyd Rebellion uh, was happening and uh, Trump sent shock troops to drive them out with tear gas and, and concussion grenades just so we could have a photo op holding a Bible in front of a church. And, as the grandson of a Baptist preacher, I got to tell you, it just is so, I can't even describe the mixture of sadness and anger and frustration that the idea of the Prince of Peace being invoked uh, to justify violence is like, it, it offends every part of my sensibility, but I will remain centered in calm, not fear or anger. And I will recognize that Yes, all of the things that Skip has said are, are true, and it does seem unlikely uh, that the ability to sort of garner the apparatus to support an attempted coup is there, but it doesn't address the fact that there is a larger social movement that is actually bringing forth. Remember that Donald Trump literally called out to the Proud Boys, which are explicit uh, violent white or violent uh, ethnic nationalists uh, to stand by and or to stand back and stand by. That was a clear, that's not even a dog whistle, y'all. That's like using a bullhorn 
uh, to actually uh, teletype. And, and if you look at the web, if you go online and do an internet search, you'll find that the Proud Boys have literally said that, right? Like that, that's how they understood it. They understood it uh, to be directions from the Fuhrer. So the other thing is we'll get into some of these other uh, uh, resources that are available because I think that they literally uh, are part of the next thing uh, to do. So Marissa, do you want to bring up the next slide? Sorry, I'm having a little problem screen sharing, but we'll get there. I often say if we can't handle the little problems, we can't handle the big ones. Uh, and I believe since, since I'm here, I believe we could really literally resist uh, a coup peacefully and nonviolently. So I believe we can do the big stuff. So I, I have no problem imagining that we get through this small little glitch. <laughs> Okay. So the next thing that uh, Marissa is sharing with you is called the front line, uh, and you can see the website there. And what you what's really great about that is uh, that there this is a broad group of folks who are training and mobilizing in order to be peaceful, nonviolent election defenders. Uh, to be able uh, to ensure that that mass movement is actually already there. Because what we don't want to do is to be unprepared. As Gladys points out, the scenario uh, is the response uh, of ordinary folks uh, and to be prepared to respond. And again, the front line, which is uh, are doing uh, mass meetings and uh, direct action trainings, they're also uh, talking about how to use social media and texting uh, and doing a whole series of election defense trainings, which uh, are a little more strategic and a little more focused. And so if anyone is interested in there, uh, in that, I would encourage you to take a look there. And I'm wondering, Marissa, if you have anything to add there. No, I don't. I'm not as familiar with their work. So uh, at this point, uh, uh, the, let's just go to the next slide perhaps, and then we'll uh, circle back. I see that there are three open Q and A's, Don, uh, but maybe we'll do just the resources and then we'll circle back uh, to those. So keep those cards and letters coming, as Art Linklater said. Uh, feel free to just use the chat for all panelists and attendees, or if you prefer, as Don said, remember that you can go to the Q and A uh, and, uh, uh, Joni, Anonymous, and uh, Sabden, we'll get to those comments as well. Uh, Marissa, do you want to talk about this one or should I? You go ahead, David. Okay, so, so non, No More Stolen Elections uh, is a, uh, a, an effort that's being spearheaded by the Liberty Tree Foundation for a Democratic Revolution. Uh, this is a group of folks who, uh, and, and I'll confess my own uh, participation in this effort, it really came out of the 2004, or 2000 campaign in 2004, uh, where we had actually seen uh, folks contesting elections and uh, 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 the, the fact that some elections have been at best questionable, at worst actually stolen uh, through the use of uh, uh, various different means. Uh, and the concept of no more stolen elections in a nutshell is to host voter assemblies uh, starting the day after the election in order to share stories about what you saw, what you experienced, so we don't allow the corporate media uh, to begin to frame uh, like what happened. The reality is that it was voter assemblies in Ohio uh, in 2004 that actually helped get the story out about what actually happened. Uh, and uh, if you wanna uh, know that story in detail, John Con the, the great uh, Congressperson John Conyers, uh, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, actually hosted a uh, uh, hearings uh, that I had the uh, privilege of participating in uh, and an entire uh, short booklet uh, was published called What Happened in Ohio. In a nutshell, what you can say is we don't know for sure if that election was stolen. What we do know is that we can't be confident in the election results that were reported. Uh, and that's because of an entire series of 
of objectively demonstrably factual things that happened, not the least of which was the so-called black box voting uh, that, that had, had, uh, at that point was being was sweeping the country. In addition, a whole series of decisions around uh, polling places and shutting down polling places, which by the way is happening now in Texas uh, uh, under uh, Governor Abbott. That's being litigated even as we speak. So many of these things have happened before. To cut to the chase, no more stolen elections is important because this is a place where folks are saying, how can ordinary people convene together in a participatory process, much like a people's movement assembly to say, what did we see happen? What is our strategy? How are we going to actually collectively act in our local community where you live, work, play, and pray? Because one of the things that I think is really important to recognize is our agency is not at the national level. Our agency is in our community with our neighbors, and that may include folks who may have pulled levers for a candidate uh, that you didn't agree with. But what we're trying to do is to say, no, no, the integrity of the election result uh, is what we're trying to protect here, not one candidate or another. The integrity of the process. If we cannot have confidence in the integrity of our election process, then, then elections are a sham. And that's, I think, what No More Stolen Election promises us. Thank you. Well, I think um, next up on the slide deck is talking about People's Strike and a little bit about what Cooperation Jackson is doing to organize. And I think what you just shared is a great segue into um, talking about people's movement assemblies and how, how you are preparing at the local level, as well as what you know about Cooperation Jackson and what they're up to. However, I'm wondering if we want to get to some of the questions um, in the queue first. I think that makes sense. Don, do you want to read those out or should Marissa, should you do it? One of you should actually do that and then we'll just talk about it. Over to you, Don. All right. Well, the first question that we received was from Bonnie Baruki. Uh, and she was asking about the quote, uh, the movement generation quote you put in the beginning of your presentation. She says, uh, we seem to be up against someone who is about winning, not governing, Trump. How does the quote you begin with apply here? Can governing happen without winning? What a fantastic uh, uh, <laughs> question. Uh, and I am genuinely grateful for the question uh, because I'll confess y'all, as a peaceful revolutionary, I don't think that we're merely going to vote our way in to a, a peaceful restructuring of society. It's part of the reason that I invest, frankly, so much of my psychic energy and my social change time in transition, because the, the, the framework that I began, resist and build, like right now we're talking about resist because we have to, but what, what fills my soul with joy is building alternatives. And for me, uh, I think that we can govern ourselves, whether we win or lose elections, by creating at the local level new cooperative systems for how we actually meet our material tangible needs. So that means things like helping to nurture, build, and support worker-owned cooperatives. It means helping to create community land trusts, both for protecting wildlands, but also to help uh, for housing alternatives. And by the way, let's add helping to nurture and build housing cooperatives and breaking down the idea uh, that uh, uh, every household has to be a single family dwelling uh, where everybody is in one spot. I mean, I, I think about you, Don, I know you and I have both lived in communal housing you know, for most of our adult lives. And, and I can say for me personally, you know, I find it an incredibly uh, uh, beautiful and wonderful way to live. Uh, I think that it's actually more natural for us actually to be living uh, in these uh, communal situations where we're sort of, uh, you know, like, you know, you have your own private space to be sure, but literally even within that household, uh, you're living in a more collective way. Wait, but wait, there's more because we could also be supporting participatory budgeting at the local level. We could be supporting public banking uh, at both the local and uh, at the state level. 
uh, we could be uh, supporting the efforts for local democratic control of both energy production and distribution modalities. The point is, y'all, uh, that the, 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 the question around uh, can we govern even if we don't win an election, the answer is yes, but we have to think differently about how we relate to the state. And frankly, stop being so damn subservient and obsequious. Uh, and remember uh, that uh, winning actually means living a good life where we are uh, in, in proper relationship with each other and the natural world. Uh, and that that does not require actually ha you know, having control of the state apparatus. And by that, I mean municipal, county, state, or even national apparatus. We can actually do that. And I think the transition U.S., uh, is one of the players to help facilitate that process. All right. Yeah, I love that yeah. question too. Yeah. Marissa, did you want to say something? Well, again, it's just, I would love to hear about how people's movement assemblies tie in to, you know, we might not be winning at the national level, but we can still win at the local level by beginning to practice direct democracy. So thank you for that, uh, Marissa. And I think uh, there may be a slide. If not, I can tell you that the People's Movement Assembly process, um, uh, some folks uh, that have studied in the Global South uh, may know about Encuentros, which the Zapatistas used. Uh, the uh, uh, others uh, maybe remember Occupy Wall Street and the General Assembly process. But the, at, at core, a people's movement assembly, uh, which the No More Stolen Elections is doing around voter assemblies, is literally a, a very uh, a tightly facilitated uh, process of bringing people together in a popular education mode that says, in a participatory way, let's share our experiences because it believes we are all teachers and we are all students. Uh, and that we have the capacity to understand not only what is happening, but to actually make uh, strategies and then implement those collective democratic decisions. And the thing is, we have to recognize our current society has not taught us these skills. Uh, you know, you are lucky if you had uh, somebody in your life who actually, uh, from your childhood, taught to empower you and and, and gave you a sense of agency. For most of us, our entire lives, we've been taught a power over system and you're either in power or you're having power exerted over you. And developing the culture of a participatory power with model uh, is the key. And the, I, I'm gonna say it really explicitly. You have to start with that intent. You cannot, like you have to actually believe uh, that the idea of sharing power with one another is actually a better way to proceed. And I will uh, remind myself and share with you a line that my mama taught me. Um, and that was uh, in response to the phrase, and some of you have probably heard this, uh, the ends justify the means. And this is the idea that whatever result you're looking for, the process to get there is less important. Just get to where you get. Uh, like the, the end is what's really matters. And my mama taught me, no, that's never true because the means are the ends in the making. So if I'm committed to a peaceful democratic society, then the means to get there have got to be peaceful and democratic. Because if I, uh, if I engage in a violent effort to get to peace, I can never get there. If I engage in a non-democratic uh, fashion to get to popular democracy, we can never get there. So there's more to say about the people's movement assemblies and how that could work, but that's, and I know I see that we're getting some good uh, comments and questions coming in, but that's my effort to address your, your question, Marissa. Thank you. All right, so we have um, a couple practical questions about the upcoming election. Uh, one from Joni Carley. If Biden is elected, he is president on January 20th, no matter what. Why can't he just call the Capitol Police to remove the grifter? 
<laughs> well, uh, Jody, the answer is uh, I, I suspect that would happen. And I, again, as we have sort of said earlier, I, in response uh, uh, to what Skip had shared, it does look like uh, the, the system is not going to allow, or at least not voluntarily allow, the response. What we're saying, I think, uh, in this conversation, certainly what Kali Akuno and myself and others who are trying to organize is, we need to build the infrastructure of a peaceful mass democracy movement. We need to actually be prepared uh, to, to exercise those muscles. And part of this, frankly, folks, is a recognition uh, that we have been not going to the civic gym. We have not been doing a good job of exercising. We're a little bit flabby. We're a little bit out of shape. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I think from my way of thinking, this preparation is to have clarity about what we see happening. And again, for me, it is less about the individual and more about recognizing this historic moment, because it's not just one moment. It is a big pattern. I do believe that there's going to be a, uh, we're, if we're in a conjuncture, and if I'm right about this, then fascism uh, and its possibility is uh, something that we're going to have to actually confront and not just, and you don't win that or lose that at the ballot box. Yeah, uh, so I think it's uh, Sadba O'Flynn uh, is asking, at what point over the course of the delayed results might we know that a coup is happening? Listen, um, I think that uh, 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 at the end of the, the night, we'll get our first taste. Um, uh, because if, if, the, if the narrative is uh, that Biden has won in a landslide, uh, then that's a particular frame, right? Uh, and, you know, Proud Boys and others uh, are going to frankly feel disempowered uh, and it's not likely uh, that we see this. If it's a super close election, uh, that's what I think is going to, uh, to be our, our first uh, bit of data. That's our data point, right? And then what happens out of the White House, uh, what happens uh, in the national media uh, uh, will be guiding. That, that's my quick reaction. And again, I would welcome Marissa or Don to, to share your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think it's uh, important that we're, if we're mail-in voting, that we get those ballots in early so that they can be counted by election night. Um, because I, I do think that a, a definitive result at that point uh, could take a lot of the kind of uncertainty, could sap a lot of the energy uh, of the white supremacists and the fascists uh, that might be looking to capitalize on that confusion. So yeah, that and just helping to fight voter suppression, uh, extremely important because yeah, you know, even if they're not able to overthrow the government, we want to ensure that there's as little violence as possible. Um, you have any thoughts on that, Marissa? No, I don't on that, but um, I'm interested in going to, to David Cutter's question about, that's, I feel there's a couple more kind of practical scenario questions. And then it seems like there's a theme of understanding like the, the people strike, um, how that works. So maybe we can go to David first. Um, they're saying, my concern is that the outcomes of elections in each state will be decided, of course, at the state level, and that those results will be rigorously contested by the Republicans, assuming they lose in the courts. If these court cases go to the federal courts, and given that the courts have been packed by appointees of the president, then the decisions coming out of the courts will be biased, but be expressed under the guise of democracy. Is this a plausible outcome? And if so, how do we prevent it? And I think this is another question on that theme of, um, yeah, how do we know if there's issues with election integrity? 
So again, it's, it's a profound question, David, and uh, uh, the, the best way I know how to answer it is uh, uh, messily because there's not a clear and easy answer. So I just wanna honor that I don't think that there's a clear and easy answer. I can tell you this, uh, that uh, many people, uh, myself included, believe, well, actually what we know is that in 2000, Al Gore actually won the electoral college vote. Uh, we know this because uh, in Florida, if all of the votes had been counted, and in fact they were ultimately by the New York Times because they used the Freedom of Information Act and actually got all of the ballots and actually counted them. And you know what? Al Gore actually won the state of Florida. Uh, remember that that, uh, that process though was stopped by the US Supreme Court and here's the kicker, Al Gore had chosen to only do a recount in certain uh, counties, which ended up being a strategic mistake, a tactical mistake, but even deeper still, Al Gore acquiesced. And you know, in other countries, and there is a long history of this, and I, I will uh, say I wanna circle up to Tom Jablonski's uh, question next, because it's important. Uh, but in other countries, when there are coups, people go out into the streets and bang pots and pans and try to actually uh, stop the process. Uh, but the problem is that when people were going out into the streets in 2000 and trying to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not right. You can't have the Supreme Court stop, stop the counting of votes, right? Uh, and Al Gore went along with it. And I'm just going to name it because Al Gore was more concerned uh, about his place within the ruling elite and the, order, quote, orderly transfer of power than he was about actually securing the election that he ultimately won. And it's hard to really be part of a mass movement if there's not actually resistance from the person who had an election uh, stolen, if they're actually helping to facilitate it. So this, this, what I'm getting at here, uh, David, is that for me, uh, we, we don't have a guarantee, but back to choose democracy, there is a long history of how nonviolent civil disobedience can actually stop coups. Uh, and that uh, even if there are, are contests, like I am a lawyer, right? Uh, and I have often said that you do not get justice in a court. Uh, at best, uh, the, the entire US legal system is designed to protect property rights, not human rights. And the court system doesn't even know how to address the concept of ecological rights or the rights of a forest as an ecosystem or uh, the, our community rights. Like we, we really have to be thinking differently. And I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm trying to say, I frame your question differently. I think that I have a certain amount of agency in my community. And that's why I have already created uh, a series of events. One, my community on October 19th, uh, I'm hosting a conversation just like this in my community to actually have this conversation and what are we going to do? And for us, uh, it is a rally at our county courthouse uh, the, uh, on November 4th, Wednesday, the day after the election to start that public participatory uh, uh, voter assembly or people's movement assembly process associated with this election. Yeah, did you want to go to Tom's question next, David? I think that would be good. Uh, and again, Marissa, I, I, I know that uh, you were expecting to facilitate the conversation and Kali's not here, so, but I do want to encourage you, if you've got thoughts along the way, to please you know, share them. So for now, I'll uh, read off Tom's uh, question. He says, uh, can you talk about the successes you believe nonviolent actions have really accomplished in the long run. My take on typical nonviolent movements are that they temporarily force the hand of the powers that be to placate the participants of the nonviolent actions. Uh, it gives an example of Gandhi and his movements forced the British to leave India earlier than they likely would have, but it didn't really leave the Indian people better off. Uh, and there's a lot lot more to this, um, but maybe you could step in there. All right, so uh, I am going to drop into the chat uh, a response, and the response is to you, a URL uh, from the Harvard Gazette, 
uh, that is a review of uh, a book that I would heartily recommend. It's called Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent uh, Conflict. It's from, by Harvard professor Erica Chenoweth, who literally goes through using rigorous uh, scientific uh, uh, social science methodology, and she explains why civil resistance campaigns actually attract uh, more people, and if you actually study it, they are more successful uh, than violent responses. Now, um, at the root of your question, at least as I understand it, uh, Tom, is to ask uh, if there's anything that can be done in response uh, to a coup, and I think that the answer is yes, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I with respect, I just completely disagree with the premise of your, your question uh, that seems to uh, suggest that the Indian people uh, were worse off because they engaged in nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. I think that's objectively provenly false. Uh, were there other problems? Absolutely. There is no such thing as a panacea. But if there is a coup, you have to respond. And my argument is you have to respond nonviolently. Yeah, and there's there's the victories that have been won by these nonviolent movements, of which there are so so many. Uh, but it also that organizing in itself builds links of solidarity between people that can be extremely helpful, uh, both in other resistance scenarios and in going about and building the world that we want and continuing to hold our politicians accountable. Um, so it, it seems like that, that work is never lost. And, and it's the work, right? I mean, like, again, at the, and perhaps I'm, I'm misunderstanding the question, right? Because it's just uh, typing it out. So, but I will just say Don's point to me speaks to the fact that I do this work, uh, not merely because tactically I think, uh, 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 it is um, uh, that we can win. I do this work because it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and I feel, for whatever reason, uh, not just inspired, I feel obliged, y'all. Like, I feel obliged to be part of an effort to create a peaceful, just, democratic, and ecologically sustainable society. And I suspect that so do you. I suspect that the reason that you're part of transition, that part of the reason that you're doing this uh, is because you believe that ordinary people actually have the capacity and the power to actually make these levels of changes. So I'm not saying that these things that we're laying out are guarantees. I'm saying this is my assessment of the best, uh, most practical way to respond to what looks like growing fascism and a potential coup. I was wondering, since we have about 15 minutes left, if we can talk a bit about the people's strike as well as some of the, the other questions related to a strike uh, we've seen, which are, um, could this work? <laughs> like basically, what are the connections, the level of organization in place to actually um, pull off a successful national strike? And I'm just gonna put up the, the people's strike slide right now while you respond, David. Sure, so, um, you know, the, 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 and remember the, that uh, People Strike came out of uh, a call by Cooperation Jackson, and as Don shared at the very beginning, sadly, Kali is hospitalized, uh, so we send him love and uh, healing energy. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I wish Kali was here to actually talk about it, but I can tell you that there are now already thousands of folks participating uh, in this network of resistance. And to take a step back and share, People's Strike began on May Day uh, uh, as a way to say the, the COVID epidemic is raging and it's very clear, and I wanna be uh, really transparent, uh, that the dictates of capital and capitalism are going to require us to go back to work for the quote economy, uh, even though it is unsafe to do. Uh, and that that was being led and driven uh, by the system itself, not merely a Republican, not merely a Democrat, but the system itself was going to demand this. And we were trying uh, to call 
forth the idea of strikes. And by strikes, we mean withholding labor, but also withholding uh, capital. That means uh, to, to begin to prepare to convince people, stop paying your medical debts, stop paying your rent, like stop, like stop paying for the, 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 the things that we think that we have a right to uh, in this current society, because we're being told that the, 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 the national apparatus makes us sacrifice our own health and put ourselves at, at jeopardy of literal death uh, from COVID in order to be forced to go back to work. So that's what People Strike began as uh, on May Day. And it was gaining strength and momentum. And then the Minneapolis Police Department murdered George Floyd. Uh, and a uprising uh, took place, uh, and I say thankfully, an uprising took place in this country. Uh, and it became a true rebellion. And we not only practically, but, but gratefully at People Strike took a step back and said, Black Lives Matter and the movement uh, uh, in response for that is taking the lead and we are taking our direction from it. Uh, and you know, just to name it, if you don't know Kali, he is an African-American and Cooperation Jackson is probably like 95% uh, black folks. So it's clearly a black led black movement. But the, the Floyd uprising went beyond COVID, right? It was, it was a response. So we engaged and related uh, to that movement to the best of our ability. Uh, even as we said, the concept of strikes and withholding labor and withholding capital when necessary is a tactic that ought to actually be part of a broader strategy, just like nonviolent civil disobedience is a tactic, right? And this is the point that I'm trying to get to, goals, strategies, tactics. My goal and the goal of those at People Strike is to restructure this society. Our uh, strategy uh, is to build alternatives that actually meet people's needs, to teach ourselves the skills and the tools necessary to both meet our needs and organize ourselves and educate ourselves. And the tactics include strikes, the tactics includes media, the tactics include nonviolent civil disobedience, resist and build. So the people strike is actually a way to, and by the way, people's movement assemblies is one of the tactical considerations and part of that larger strategy. Uh, so I'll stop there because I don't want to uh, just turn this into a nothing but a, a people strike, but go to the website peoplestrike.org. There is a pledge of resistance that I know Kali uh, and Cooperation Jackson and the people strike has just, uh, uh, is starting to circulate. So go to pledge of resistance on the people strike website and you can see that as well. Thanks, David. Um, I do want to jump in and say I know there are folks in the transition movement who are resistant to the idea of resistance in terms of protesting. Um, and I encourage, I encourage folks to think of strategic resistance um, as, a, as a building block of creating the, the opening or the space for our new systems to um, to begin developing. Um, I wanted to share the example of uh, recently in Philadelphia, um, 50 vacant lots were obtained for a community land trust because of um, occupation of those, those lots. I think after many other, many other ways of trying to address um, housing and security in Philadelphia were unsuccessful. And um, now there's, you know, the foundation of a community land trust a pillar of the, the solidarity or new economy, and it probably wouldn't have happened without um, that resistance, as well as, as well as a lot of organizing and building. Um, and then regarding the question of what kind of connections or networks does Transition US have in place to facilitate a strike, um, Transition US is very much collaboratively um, governed and we have a, like our, our grassroots network is connected through our collaborative design council and and other methods but it's really it would need to come from the local groups if and and it can also happen autonomously in your community but if you want to you know organize a national action 
there are ways to connect with other transition groups to share your organizing work. But we aren't going to call a national strike. We will, <laughs> we will co-facilitate. It's not yet. <laughs> There's not many of us <laughs> at Transition US. We have about seven minutes left here. Do we want to grab any more of those questions and then have a, some, some closing remarks? <clears throat> Don, are you on top of the, the stack of questions? Is there are any jumping out to you to share? Yeah, there was uh, one from Skip. Um, he says, I have received my ballot, but plan to spoil my ballot and vote in person so that my vote is counted and reported on the day of the election. In Pennsylvania, mail-in ballots aren't counted until the day of, or maybe day after election day. The theory is try to remove any doubt on the outcome as of election day. However, I've heard others say it's better to get your ballot in now and keep the line shorter. What do you recommend for someone in my situation? Should I vote in person or mail in advance? Well, I mean, my short answer is if you're able to, like ideally in, in, in many jurisdictions, you're able to actually get your ballot in advance and then take it, right? Uh, so that's, that's the best and most ideal way. And it's actually how I'm doing it. Uh, I'm literally taking my ballot uh, uh, before election day to the elections office and turning it in. Uh, there's also um, uh, something called ballot tracks. Uh, if you go to the website, wheresmyballot.com, Find out if your county is eligible for ballot tracking. That will, all you have to do is enter your county into uh, that website and you can find out if it's available. And I know all of California is doing it, for example. And what that means is by literally signing up um, with uh, your name and social security number, it will literally tell you, okay, uh, 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 we have your, uh, like, your, like uh, I can go in right now and it, because it I did it, I signed up and it said, your ballot has been mailed to you. That's where we know where your ballot is. And I know because, yep, I got it. And uh, today, actually, ironically, I'm turning in my ballot. And uh, tomorrow I'm gonna go to where's my ballot, uh, or actually I've signed up and I should get uh, a text that says, your ballot has been received by your county administrator. And then get this, in California, anywhere in the state, uh, when it actually goes, uh, uh, through the process of being counted, it will say your ballot has been recorded, your ballot has been counted. So there is, like again, there is a way to actually do this, uh, but, uh, uh, and California, I think has done a phenomenal job of doing it, but you can also uh, use ballot tracks uh, to find out if, if your county does that. And again, the last thing I'll just say for myself, I personally, um, I like, uh the, the 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 paper ballot and and going through the process uh uh so but but it's really totally up to you uh skip whatever whatever sort of uh, makes sense to you but most of the election integrity folks i know use a paper ballot take it to the election office yourself whether it's uh, in advance or uh day up and i I think that if we have time for one more question, I think this might be a good one to end on. Uh, this is from Tom. Uh, he was asking, what is your vision for a peaceful and democratic society? Well, I mean, uh, go to the website cooperationhumble.org and we lay out uh, 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 what our vision is. And it is where everybody is actually having their basic human needs met, and ultimately that should be codified under law. Uh, the, and everybody, I believe, actually not only has, like, I believe people should have the right to meaningful productive work. Uh, that's uh, the Green Party's Green New Deal uh, actually imagines a series of uh, not employment, uh, unemployment offices, but employment offices where each community gets to decide what it is that we actually need. And when I or somebody else shows up, they say, oh, great, great. Let's find out what you're good at, uh, what you're passionate about and what the community needs and match you up accordingly. So it would literally take completely restructuring society to do it, but that's what I do. And that's literally how uh, we operate at Cooperation Humble. 
Thank you, David. Um, I wanted to respond to, to Tom's other comment, kind of as my closing thoughts. Um, Tom has said meeting our needs is indeed what the focus needs to be, and in particular enabling people to meet their own needs, not depending on the systems of power to spoon feed us what they want us or allow us to have, which is how they maintain their power. And I just wanted to say a lot of, you know, a lot of work in the transition movement is on reskilling, obviously, and, and learning how to, to meet our needs, you know, at the household level, at the neighborhood level, at the community level. And we've done a lot of that and many of us are feeding ourselves and and um and sharing our skills and that i think that will always you know be a really important part of transition and as we think about okay now that we have 10 years of history in the us how does our movement grow and evolve um we're hearing that you know in order to scale up we need to be looking at transforming our economy through the way we do business and um and really engaging in the political system, at least at the community level, um, where we do have agency to, you know, be, be creating the, the policies and laws that we want to see to allow our work to scale um, in a bigger way more rapidly. Um, and that's a big part of the work of this politics and policy working group. Um, and we will hopefully in the new year um, be up on the Transition US web website and have better channels in place for people to participate in this group. Um, we're going to, I think, be growing all of our national working groups. There's about five of them right now. Um, and we're also planning likely an online national gathering for next year. So there will be many ways to um, connect and get involved as we are taking our organizing to the next level. Um, any closing words from you, Don, and, and from David? David, you first, if you have anything. Uh, you know, nothing at all. Just uh, g deep gra gratitude for Marissa and Don for helping to make this happen and for all of you for coming out to engaging what I think is a very hard and challenging conversation and uh, being willing to engage in an effort to think through what is the best thing that each of us can do. I guess that is the point, right? I I'm, not I'm not encouraging, you should do whatever makes sense to you. I I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Well, I want to wish us all the best of luck in the next few weeks. Uh, thank David. Uh, send some more healing wishes, thoughts and prayers to Kali. Um, and to say, you know, hopefully we'll see some of you at our Stories for Changing World event later today, a very different kind of event. Um, and uh, if not, hope we'll see you very soon. So thank you all and feel free to leave any um, Thanks, sir. Final comments in the chat. Wonderful.